Welcome to A Reason for Hope, your question connection with the entire Word of God. We would love for you to join in our conversation. Simply follow us on our Facebook page at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. If you have a question, email or text us at questionsforhope at gmail.com. Now here's your host, pastor, author, and Bible teacher, Scott Richards, along with his right-hand man, Sean Richards. Well, a very good afternoon, morning, or evening to you, wherever you may be. Welcome to this edition of A Reason for Hope. As usual, we are here to answer your questions on the Word of God, whether you're listening to us on a radio broadcast or podcasting with us live on uh, one of our media outlets. We are here to, uh, well, uh, scratch you where you itch as far as your knowledge of God's Word is concerned. You got questions about the Bible, questions about applying the Bible to your life, questions about uh, how to defend uh, faith in the Bible as God's inspired Word in these increasingly skeptical times. Bring them on. We would love to hear about those things. Uh, We are also uh, very much open to talking about the events of today or even the events of tomorrow through biblical prophecy. Wherever we go, it's entirely up to you. It's your questions that determine the content of each and every edition of A Reason for Hope. A bit of a technical glitch that we're dealing with uh, here today as far as the live uh, aspect of the broadcast is concerned. Uh, it'll be, the, as far as the podcast is concerned, it will be uh, shown on a delayed basis after we get done recording this, then we are going to uh, go ahead and post. But we've got plenty of your questions that you've sent in in other times, as well as a number of prophecy updates that we want to get to. But before we do, uh, Sean, would you like to open us up in a word of prayer? Happy to. Dad, thank you that we have the chance to be available. Equip us to not only share your word, but your heart. Allow your people to be ministered to in the timing that you see fit, and just allow everything else in this day to be as much an offering as we present ourselves now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, so, um, what's going on? Well, uh, it's uh, kind of ironic that uh, we are uh, restricted in a sense of the usual live uh, interchange that we have here uh, because uh, there are a number of uh, events that have uh, hit just over the last couple of days that we would uh, consider uh, fitting under the uh, category of prophecy updates that we like to provide for you on a regular basis. Let's uh, jump into some of them. Uh, One of them, uh, a fascinating article that was uh, posted on the uh, townhall.com website, uh, talked about a development that has happened in Israel as far as their defense from outside invasion. As you know, if you followed us on the broadcast, Israel has had to deal uh, with one of the greatest threats to their security, missile attacks, whether it's uh, fairly... uh, primitive missile technology, the Katusha rockets that are launched uh, from Gaza, or the far more sophisticated investment of Iranian technology uh, in the uh, area around Lebanon dominated by Hezbollah. Uh, That seems to be one of the more difficult things that the uh, Jewish nation has been dealing with as far as uh, protecting Uh, their people is concerned. But there's been a uh, remarkable development, an announcement made earlier today that could uh, be a game changer as far as security in the Middle East with real implications uh, as far as at least my understanding of uh, a uh, particularly a large piece of the prophetic puzzle that uh, we'll see uh, revealed. Uh, According to an article in the Jerusalem Post today, Israel will surround itself with a defensive laser wall with new missile interception technology to be ready within a year, according to Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. Uh, He made a speech today at the Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv. Uh, The IDF will begin using the laser interception system in the early next year, first experimentally and later operationally, starting in the south. That is the area that would be um, vulnerable to rockets from Gaza. Uh, This will allow us, according to Bennett, uh, in the medium to long term, to surround Israel with a laser wall that will defend us from missiles, rockets, uh, UAVs, that is drones, and other threats that will essentially take away the strongest card our enemies have against us. Uh, The defense ministry successfully intercepted drones with the powerful airborne laser system installed on light aircraft in June. The system downed several UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, at a range of one kilometer with a 100% success rate. The ministry intends to build a laser with a power of 100 kilowatts will have an effective range of 20 kilometers or over uh, 12 miles. Uh, the, The fascinating thing 
about this technological breakthrough is, first of all, it's got to have uh, the mad mullahs in Iran pulling their hair out by the roots because they have invested quite a bit of uh, money and technology and manpower in making Lebanon into a a missile base, for lack of a better term. Uh, They have boasted that they now have uh, missiles in place uh, in Uh, the area around Lebanon, dominated by Hezbollah, that now have uh, a reach that could uh, strike Tel Aviv, uh, even into Jerusalem itself, if they so desired. When you combine that with the uh, inferior but still damage-producing technology that you have in the south, it it was really a problem. Now, you've probably heard of the Iron Dome defense system, which is sort of an anti-missile missile missile, uh, form of technology. When uh, the Iron Dome detects a launch, it then sends interceptor missiles that knock these missiles out of the sky. And that's all well and good, but you don't get all of those missiles. And uh, as uh, the old saying goes, uh, from Israel's point of view, you have to be 100% accurate as far as the Iron Dome is concerned. As far as Israel's enemies are concerned, only one missile needs to get through before uh, some serious damage and loss of life can happen. So the advent of this kind of uh, anti-missile technology, and it's fascinating that it is described as a defensive laser wall that will surround Israel at that point with lasers, we remember uh, from, uh, what was that, uh, Austin Powers. Uh, So uh, the the fascinating thing to me about all of this, and and where I think it ties in prophetically, is it answers a question uh, that has always kind of troubled me uh, about the event that is described in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, the Gog and Magog invasion of uh, Israel. Uh, The fascinating thing uh, about this is that when this invading uh, army is described, uh, in verse 14 of Ezekiel chapter 38, we read this, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, the commander, of this invading army. And for those of you not familiar with this, this is a prophetic picture of a last day's invasion of Israel dominated, led by the people that make up modern Russia, Gog and Magog uh, are those people, joined with a a number of uh, different nations. Iran is mentioned as one of them uh, by its uh, more traditional name, Persia. Uh, Central Asiatic Muslim republics, part of it all, perhaps even Turkey, uh, a part of it all, uh, and uh, some of the uh, the North African nations like Libya are mentioned, as well as uh, the area around uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia, and so on. But uh, this invasion is going to take place when Israel has, in a sense, its guard down. Uh, we believe from this that uh, Israel being a land of unwalled cities at this time, that this is going to be an event that takes place after Israel enters into a seven-year peace treaty with uh, the Antichrist. He is going to bring peace and security to the earth for three and a half years. And uh, again, in Isaiah chapter 28, we are told that Israel at one point is going to make a covenant with death, and they are going to uh, believe that that is going to be that which provides them security. So with all that being said, this huge invading army comes out of nowhere. I believe it's going to be a double cross of the Antichrist. It's going to happen at the three and a half year mark. Uh, The Russians and uh, their uh, Iranian and uh, Islamic allies, for lack of a better term, are going to seize the opportunity to be able to come on in. But this is the detail that I think uh, might be explained by this development of this laser wall technology that is able to knock out uh, missiles and uh, UAVs, and uh, I think even by extension, uh, you could even talk about fighter jets and bombers and so forth. In verse 14 of Ezekiel 38, we read, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, Thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people of Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place, you and all of them, uh, with many peoples with you from the far north, a mighty army, all of them riding on horses. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land, so the nations may know me when I'm hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes." Thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I was spoken in uh, former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? 
And we are told, and when it comes to pass in that same time, when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show on my face, for my jealousy and the fire of my wrath I've spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that crawl on the earth. Notice the uh, language that we see there. It's very reminiscent of the book of Genesis. And all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. And I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him and his troops and the many people who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord." Now, the fascinating thing about all of this is these invading armies are described as using some very unmodern weapons and approaches. Uh, They're going to approach the borders of Israel riding on horses. Uh, Some people would say, well, maybe that was just a uh, colloquialism. Ezekiel never saw, say, a Humvee or uh, an all-terrain vehicle. Uh, And so uh, riding on horses would be the closest thing that he could come to to describing this. You know, I think we make a mistake when we de-literalize the Bible or or, or make it into something like, well, you know, there's just an attempt here to uh, describe the indescribable from, say, the point of view of a guy like Ezekiel. The fatal flaw with all of that is, remember, this is not Ezekiel's take on what's going on. This is God's take, right? Right, and, and we'll be talking a bit about that tonight as well. The uh, blood moons and the sun turning black is, oh, well, this is a solar or lunar eclipse, and so we can predict the date of the end times yeah. and, uh, by extension, the rapture by noting patterns in these things. No, uh, we'll, again, be clarifying in a moment, at least at the time of this recording, 2 two twenty two will be, of course, on the book of Revelation chapter 6. But in the same way, when we read these prophetic passages, the attempts that are made, noble-minded as they are, to try to make this more palatable for a, I guess, non-believing audience is to first take a step back from what the text says and says, what does this make sense to me in regards to? And that is a good step in interpreting the Bible. But then if we take two steps too back, notice we're still removed from the text, and say, well, that probably doesn't mean what it says, therefore I'm going to say what it probably means. And that is... And and we've crossed the line at that point from revelation to speculation, right? Yeah, to inferring on the text what probably is the case rather than what's stated. It's fine to take a step back and ask, does that actually make sense? What's the context? What's the setting? Are there other examples where these sort of things are described in bizarre ways. But when we're asked the question, okay, if it says horses, does that mean horse? Well, we can go to other examples where it's plainly spiritual. In Revelation chapter 6, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, there's not going to be a cosmic pony out there bringing on these plagues. But in this case, there's nothing to indicate that this is symbolic in any way, shape, or form. The text does not appear or begin with this clarification, a sign in the heavens or in the heavenly throne or before God I saw All these things are describing earthly nations and earthly equines. Now, this is where it gets fascinating to me because, uh, you know, there was always that uh, that catch that people would have. Well, you know, it's fascinating that, uh, say, you know, the Russian people are prophesied here and an alliance with Iran and Russia is prophesied here. And the idea that uh, these uh, nations, even Turkey, uh, would turn from being, say, a member of uh, NATO uh, to uh, ally with the enemies of Israel and so on. Uh, people would say, wow, you know, a, a lot would have to happen for that to take place. And we've seen it take place. But the, the, the biggest hurdle seems to be this idea that this invasion is going to take place, say, on horseback. I mean, people would say, well, why don't they just use... Uh, you know, bombers and, and stealth technology and, uh, and uh, unmanned air, aerial vehicles, the drone technology that is so effective in our day and age. You know, why don't they, uh, again, uh, use these kind of technologies that are involved here? Well, here, uh, with Israel's development of this laser wall, we might see a big part of the picture coming into focus. Because if you have this technology in place that can uh, literally render any kind of 
uh, aerial attack null and void. Uh, you, you can't send a ballistic missile at Israel because it's going to get knocked out of the sky as soon as it hits uh, this particular laser wall that you're talking about putting into place. So if you can't attack them from the air, you're going to probably have to attack them from the ground. The other thing that we were discovering is that uh, when it comes to modern warfare, uh, one of the most important things to take out if you're going to defeat an enemy is what's called command and control structures. In, in other words, if you have uh, anything that is electronic uh, that is guiding and directing your troops, like radio, uh, you know, again, uh, satellite technology, uh, the, the whole shooting match, GPS, uh, all of that is very important unless, of course, you've got some kind of technology that can take it out. The technology that can take it out that is being developed is called EMP technology, electromagnetic pulse technology. In other words, if you are going to defend your nation and you've got something in place that can, first of all, take any kind of missile or any kind of aerial attack off the board. And then secondly, if you've got something in place that can render any kind of electronics null and void as far as being useful in an attack, what does that leave you with? That leaves you with something that is not susceptible to either of those things. Might tickle them, but I don't think the horse he's mind. Yeah. So, you know, again, this picture of this invasion of Israel on horseback may be far more literal than any of us uh, in the post Hal Lindsey, late great planet Earth uh, era have been led to think. But fascinating development uh, going on along uh, that line today. You know? And there's other speculations that include maybe uh, society's taken a few steps back after a limited nuclear war and uh, technology has essentially been reverted back to the Renaissance era. There's uh, plenty of reason to give that credence given all of the uh, nonsense that's happening in our world today. But we need to make sure that when we're handling the Bible, it's not out of fear of the future, but anticipation for the hope that we have being fulfilled. So if we're going to look at these sort of invasions and going to be reminded of the fact that these things are certainly gearing up, then the semantics don't need to necessarily be focused on the horses or the tanks involved, but asking, okay, are we in a place where this could be fulfilled, not just within our lifetime, but maybe even before this broadcast is fulfilled? Now, when we're at, or completed, I guess. Now, when we're asking questions, so is the Gog and Magog invasion a precursor, a postcursor, or a necessity, necessary factor for the rapture? And we would say, no, absolutely not. When we're talking about the coming of our Lord and the comfort that we have at the hope of his coming, that needs to be our focus. But when we see things in Scripture being basically made more and more clear. We cannot underestimate the impact that's going to have, not only on the confidence that people have who are struggling with discouragement at these times and days, but also a reality check for those who are maybe on the fence or in opposition to the gospel. There may be something here. Yeah. So we need to be informed about these things. But uh, anything more to note on that or more to discuss? Well, I think uh, the, the, the takeaway in all of this, uh, for those of you who are wanting to be appraised of the signs of the times as far as the Scripture is concerned, you know, let's let the Scripture speak. Uh, let's make sure that we're not reading into the Scripture, saying, well, we need to take our modernistic point of view, and, uh, well, maybe horses is just a byword for Humvees. Or no, when the Bible speaks of horses, uh, unless, of course, we see something that is clearly telling us, like in Revelation chapter 6, that we're dealing with something symbolic, something spiritual, uh, when the literal sense, and please take this to the bank because it will save you an awful lot of confusion and rabbit trail running in your Christian life. When the literal sense makes sense in Scripture, seek no other sense. You know, say, well, so you take the Bible literally? Well, like, yeah, as a piece of literature, don't we have to take it literally? But if, on the other hand, you ask, do you take it woodenly? Yeah. Is every single passage devoid of any literary style and should be handled as such? Well, then we get into the realm of the ridiculous. No one handles a book that way. Yeah, I, we, for, for example, when Jesus said, I am the door, nobody looked for a doorknob on him. They you realized don't was, take the Bible he was, literally? He was talking, it, it was a form of literature that we would call a metaphor. 
and yeah. very much easily understood if you are willing to give the text that much credit. But note that when we're reading these prophecies, we need to be not just sensitive to the kind of presentations that were given about it, but also sensitive to reports that may lead us closer to it. Now, there's an equal and opposite mistake people make in dismissing yeah. all of these things as hearsay or that's, uh, that was fulfilled at some point, we don't have record of it. But then you go the opposite direction in what we call newspaper eschatology right. and say, oh, uh, they just posted a new article, the rapture's going to happen any minute, I just know it. No, we don't or, want to fall Or Antichrist, that. Antichrist, let's figure out who the Antichrist is. Right. So when we're talking about these things, make sure that we have a level head, an informed head, and a head that's first looking at the Scripture rather than the news, and make sure that they line up in that order of authority. Yeah, and so uh, definitely one to take to the bank. Uh, just remember, when you approach the Scripture, uh, go slow, take a look at the passage, ask those questions they teach you in journalism school. Who, what, where, when, why, and how? And if you do, and you have that, that bias, not necessarily that I'm going to take this woodenly, but as we see in Proverbs chapter 8, God's word is plain, God's truth is plain to all who will receive it. We don't look necessarily for a symbolic interpretation of Scripture unless symbolism is called for. We don't look for, a uh, say, a wooden uh, interpretation of the scripture, unless there is something that indicates that we're talking about something that's quite literal, quite uh, pedestrian, quite day to day. But we look for the plain understanding of the text. And I think if we have that uh, under our belts, it's going to keep us out of a peck of trouble. Another uh, prophecy update, if we got time for it. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the Bible tells us that one of the signs of the times, and it, it's certainly been persistent with us. Uh, throughout time. But uh, one of the things that you can take a look at as far as what's going to go on in the tribulation period is that the Antichrist, uh, when he comes to power, is definitely going to have it in for the Jewish people. Uh, in fact, in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, uh, we're told why God, uh, why the Antichrist and uh, the enemies of God have hated the Jewish people so much down through time. There's a definite spiritual dimension to it all. In uh, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 13, we are told, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Now, what is being referred to here? Well, obviously, the text has been set up at the beginning of the chapter. We've gotten a lot of symbols and references that tie back to Genesis chapter 26, I believe, referring to the nation of Israel and that the child that comes out from this woman with these decidedly Israel-esque uh, features. The fact that she has 12 stars on her head is a reference to Joseph's dream where he had a vision of 11 stars bowing down to him along with the sun and moon. Right. And Jacob, within the chapter, interpreted that dream for us without any correction from God, saying, are you saying that your mother and I and your 11 brothers are going to bow down and worship you? And note this point. The sun was what clothed her. The moon was under her feet. Her on her head was a tiara or a garland of 12 stars. This reference is common in Scripture and notes to be consistent in that regard. But then when you ask, well, why is it a woman? Is that a reference to the Virgin Mary? No, it's a reference to the fact that despite uh, modern discoveries, quote-unquote, women are usually the ones that produce babies. Yeah. So if she's producing a male <laughs> child, that's a necessary feature to get the point. But the story continues with a direct quotation of Psalm chapter 2 and other passages to note the Messiah was going to enter this world to her. The child that was to be born was opposed by the dragon. And within that chapter, we're told the dragon is, in fact, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Not a lot of wiggle room or room for imagination here unless you force it. So, but this so, we see, so we see in this passage that there's a real spiritual dimension mm -hmm. behind what we would call anti-Semitism in our day. Yes, that the hatred of the Jewish people is inextricably woven into the fact that God has used the Jewish people to essentially disarm him from any and every influence he has over our lives eternally. Yeah. Now, noting that hatred then is one that has not only carried through to the ages, but even unfortunately at the hands of those who call themselves Christians, this irrational hatred of the Jewish people, right. this basis for seeing basically the extermination of a people group for being nothing less than what they are 
comes from somewhere. We don't say that everyone who has negative opinions of Israel is demon-possessed, but we do acknowledge that the adversarial, that's what demon means, by the way, and devil, diabolos, adversary or accuser, this nature of hatred towards the nation of Israel is characteristic of those under the authority of Satan, not because they're possessed by him, but because like Jesus said in John chapter 8, they share his heart. You are, you are of your father the devil, and he was a murderer from the beginning. This is no more or no, I guess, more passionately directed towards any other ethnic people or historical group in all of recorded history than the Jewish people and, of course, those who would share the gospel. So if we're asked the question, where does that attitude come from, it's not from demonic over, uh, I guess, uh, control, but it certainly comes from a demonic influence, a demonic nature that is shared by those who want to honor his heart. Now note, this isn't always done willingly, but it certainly is demonstrated directly. And when we look at organizations like Islam, that literally have it interwoven into its core tenets, the hatred and despising of the Jewish people and calls for their extermination more than even their own directives in religious truth. When we look at political movements that are inextricably tied into the dismissal, the marginalization, and the demonization of the nation of Israel, we recognize that as satanic, not yeah. possessed, but certainly, certainly sharing, influenced. Yeah, yeah, certainly sharing their father's heart, whom yeah. we don't want to honor. Yeah. So when we're talking about this spiritual, I guess, overview of anti-Semitism in Revelation chapter 12, it's certainly going to include the tribulation period, but it didn't start there. Yeah. In fact, uh, the Holocaust itself was a warm-up, if you will, uh, for what is going to go on during the tribulation period. Two-thirds of the Jewish people, according to the book of Zechariah chapter 12, are going to be cut off from the land. Uh, so, you know, we, we take a look at, uh, at these things and, uh, and the, the, the idea of anti-Semitism, that the whole world would have it out for, you know, a relatively uh, small, one might even say insignificant portion of the human population. But boy, have it out for the Jews, people do. And we've really seen a lot of that take place this week. Um, Amnesty International uh, out of the UK published a 280-page report earlier this week uh, accusing the nation of Israel of being an apartheid state, as uh, the uh, term used to be applied to the nation of South Africa. All right, let's uh, take a step back. Well, and <laughs> well but yeah, let, let me tell you exactly what happened with all of this. Um, you know, again, uh, the, uh, the day after Israel President uh, Yitzhak Herzog uh, met with uh, the United Arab Emirates uh, Crown Prince Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed to make peace and normalize relations, Amnesty International decided to uh, launch this particular report saying that Israel, uh, the Israeli government, the Israeli state was an apartheid state. It should be opposed. It should be brought to an end. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, the, the, the question comes up, is Israel an apartheid state? It is a Jewish state, right? Uh, it was formed for the Jewish people. And people will say, well, see, it's, it's the Jewish state. So just like South Africa tried to have a state where races were separated and so on. So the same. no one could hold political office or influence. No one could participate in law enforcement or even any form of election and voting based on their ethnicity. That is apartheid. Now, yeah. do we now see here's that in the Israel? dictionary definition of apartheid. Okay. It is a former policy of segregation and political, social, and economic discrimination against the non-white majority in the Republic of South Africa. So, so take the application, they'd say that it would be the non-Jewish individuals in Israel. Right. If you were a non-white in apartheid South Africa, you would have a completely different and separate existence from the uh, white ruling class, if you will. So if you were not white in apartheid South Africa, you wouldn't certainly be on their uh, governing boards or their elected officials or in the police. Or have force. the right to vote. Now, now let's so, ask those four so, questions. So let's, let's ask this question. Amnesty International comes out with a statement 
that Israel is an apartheid state and as such is illegitimate, should not exist. Well, uh, our good friend Joel Rosenberg at All Israel News has a great response to all of this. Is this what Israel is engaged in? Well, hardly. 21% of Israel's population of 9.5 million uh, people are Arabs, and they have the full rights as anyone else under Israeli law. So hold on to that idea. Uh, In 1948, one million Jews lived in the Arab world, yet today there are almost no Jews living in the Arab world. Uh, Joel uh, asked some questions. What percentage of the Palestinian Authority's population is Jewish? The answer, zero. What population of Lebanon's population is Jewish? Zero. What percentage of Syria's population is Jewish? Zero. What population of Jordan, Egypt, Iraq, Libya? Uh, You could go on. Zero. And for the very few Jews, say, that still live in Syria or in Iran, and there are small populations of Jews still there, do they have equal rights under the law? No, in fact, according to the Quran, Hadith, and Sunnah, they are under what's called a dimitude status. They are, according to Surah 929, owed to half of their income in what's called the uh, jizya tax, which is essentially extortion money. You have to pay an extra tax. You are given an economic disparity, if you will, a requirement based on your religion and ethnicity that you are el-lel-ki-ted, you are people of the book, Christians and Jews and atheists. Based on your religious or ethnic affiliation, you are given economic persecution, which there is no other way to put it. But even if you want to give the Islamic world an undue amount of grace, let's just pretend that's the case and say what actually is happening in the Dimi status. You're paying not to get kicked out of the country because if you didn't pay that tax, you wouldn't face criminal charges for tax evasion. You would literally be dragged out into the street and beheaded. Which sounds uh, even more brutal than the apartheid uh, regime in South Africa. Indeed. Yeah. So, you know, again, Joel makes this point. He also makes another interesting point. If Israel is, in fact, an apartheid state, and, and that, that's the question we have to get, get into here, uh, because it, it's an accusation that keeps being made uh, with frequency and seems to be uh, magnified by uh, the, the media uh, these days. If Israel is an apartheid state, why did six leaders of Arab countries make peace with Israel? Could it be because they know that Israel is not an apartheid state and that Israel actively protects the human rights of its Arab citizens and has tried repeatedly to make uh, peace with the Palestinians? Egypt made peace with Israel in 1979. Jordan made peace with Israel in 1994. Uh, The United Arab Emirates made uh, peace with Israel in 2020, as well as Bahrain and Sudan and Morocco. Uh, That's why we see negotiations going on with Kuwait to join the Abraham Accords, if you will, uh, where we uh, have Israel and these Arab nations coming together with full diplomatic and uh, economic and even uh, defense uh, agreements between them. If Israel is an apartheid state, why in the world would they do such a thing? And how many black African-governed uh, states had full diplomatic relations with the Republic of South Africa during apartheid? We would say zero. Uh, Arab citizens of Israel, Joel points out, have the full right to vote, to form their own political parties, and serve in Israel's uh, parliament known as the Knesset. Uh, Not only uh, is that the case, at this point, 14 Arab citizens of Israel serve in the Knesset. That is the the Israeli form of parliament. Uh, The current Israeli government was only able to form a government because it was actively supported by an Israeli-Arab political party known as Ra'am. Uh, And uh, again, Arab citizens of both Israel, both Christians and Muslims, serve as judges in Israeli courts and as justices of the Israeli Supreme Court. This was something that never happened in apartheid South Africa. Arab citizens of Israel serve with distinction as Israel's military, police, academia, media, and business. Uh, And so uh, to say that Israel is an apartheid state tells me a couple of things. First of all, you don't understand Israel. And secondly, you don't understand apartheid. 
or you are basically able to lie with impunity without accountability. But no less an individual than Jimmy Carter published a uh, book where he advocated peace between the Palestinians and Israel, or he called it peace, not apartheid. That is accusing the uh, Jewish state of being an apartheid state. I repeat my point. So, you know, when uh, when we see these, these things happening, uh, when we see... Uh, something like uh, Amnesty International, which used to do just tremendous work as far as pointing out actual human rights abuses in the world, use that cachet, use that reputation, use their uh, their significance and their heft to launch this kind of an attack against Israel. Well, you know, again, we could say, why? Why out of all the nations in the world are they going after Israel? We would say it's not just political. Uh, it's not just, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, uh, a, a, a situation uh, where they are uh, not necessarily liking uh, the state of Israel for their economic policies or the thing. It really does come down to spiritual issues. And the thing that we need to understand as far as a prophecy update is, is concerned is uh, this uh, directive, this report that was put out by Amnesty International earlier this week, is something that we're going to see as a trend continuing. Uh, and it's going to pick up more steam as uh, the time of Jesus' return draws near. As a matter of fact, uh, we're told in the book of Zechariah that uh, at, in the time of the end, all nations of the world will be gathered together against Jerusalem. In other words, it's going to go on like wildfire. And, and uh, this would kind of wrap up another big controversial issue uh, that took place uh, earlier this week uh, on the ABC program, uh, The View. Uh, there uh, was a major dust up uh, that took place uh, when uh, a uh, discussion was made uh, about a uh, school board in Tennessee banning a book called Maus, M-A-U-S, A Survivor's Tale. Now, this is a graphic novel that tells the story of the Holocaust using mice as uh, a substitute for uh, the, the Jewish people in that. Uh, it, it was uh, written and illustrated by Art Spiegelman, who's Jewish, to tell the story of his family's horrifying experiences going through the Holocaust. Well, uh, the Tennessee School Board uh, said, we don't need to enable or promote this stuff about the Holocaust and the systematic murder and extermination of six million Jews in Europe during the Nazi regime. He says, I'm not denying it was horrible, brutal, and cruel. It shows people hanging, the board members said. It shows them killing kids. Why does the education system promote this kind of stuff? It's not wise or healthy. Well, uh, because if we don't learn from history and we don't rightly become horrified by the things that were done, then we're going to belittle the steps that were taken that led to it. And as the old saying is, we're going to be condemned to repeat it. So, you know, when this subject of uh, Mouse, this graphic novel, uh, came up, uh, it was a uh, subject on uh, the ABC program The View. And uh, moderator of The View, Whoopi Goldberg, uh, I guess her actual name is Karen Johnson. She changed that for Hollywood purposes. Uh, insisted that her fellow co-host be truthful about the issue of the Holocaust and admit that the Holocaust is not about race. Now, let's fill this in. Despite repeated pushback, the others kept saying it is. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg repeatedly insisted, no, it's not about race. She tried to argue that Jews are white and Germans were white, and thus the Nazi era was about white people attacking and killing other white people. It wasn't about race. It was about man's inhumanity to man. That's what it was all about. It's not about race. Well, panelist Anna Navarro countered, uh, trying to explain to Whoopi Goldberg that the Holocaust was at its core about the horrors of white supremacy. As you recall, Hitler believed the German people were the master race. The Aryan race was the master race. And one of the reasons that the Jews needed to be exterminated was because they were an inferior race. Uh, 
They were spreaders of disease. They were the cause of Germany's economic woes. They were the reason we haven't gotten back from World War I and the Great Depression. They were blamed for all of the ails of society. They were the ones in political cartoons being defamed and shamed. Does that sound familiar? But it was racial in its approach. If you ask the average uh, German, the average Nazi of that time, is this a racial issue? <laughs> they would have said, well, of course it is. As a matter of fact, the Jews had to be dehumanized to the place where uh, when the tides of the war turned uh, in uh, the documentary Shoah, uh, some Holocaust survivors talked about how the Jews sent concentration camp inmates out to dig up the mass graves uh, of the massacred Jews because they didn't want to have any evidence when the Allies got there of the atrocities they'd committed. Uh, one of the rules that went on in this particular uh, endeavor was that you couldn't refer to the bodies they were digging up as corpses or people or bodies. You had to refer to them as rags. That was the only acceptable term. Uh, they were not human beings, and if anyone violated that standard, they would be beaten to death by the guards. And you can see this being the language and terms in Steven Spielberg's film Schindler's List. Yeah, so... Uh, again, Anna Navarro pointed out that this was about white supremacy, deciding that the Jewish people were an inferior race that absolutely had no rights, whatever, including the right to live. But Whoopi Goldberg dug in and said, but these are two white groups of people. Uh, and so, as you can probably imagine, uh, the dust up was tremendous. Well, after the, the show, uh, Whoopi Goldberg began to make an apology. She said, on today's show, I said the Holocaust is not about race, but about man's inhumanity to man. I should have said it's about both. Uh, as Jonathan Greenblatt from the Anti-Defamation League shared, the Holocaust was about the Nazis' systematic annihilation of the Jewish people, whom they deemed to be an inferior race. I stand corrected. Well, that standing corrected didn't last very long. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg uh, was then suspended by ABC for two weeks to give her a good long time to think about this. But you knew a line was crossed when that echo chamber silences you. But uh, the, the following evening, uh, Whoopi Goldberg went on uh, the uh, Late Show or the uh, uh, Stephen Colbert show on uh, CBS and uh, was asked about all of this and uh, really made, in a sense, uh, a, a non-apology about the whole thing. Um, she, uh, you know, essentially said, oh, I get it, don't send me any more cards or letters. It was almost kind of a sarcastic kind of a thing, uh, you know, almost doubling down on her previous position. And so when uh, this happened, uh, ABC suspended her from The View uh, and uh, we are told in the follow-up that she feels humiliated about being disciplined by ABC execs. You should be. Uh, after following her advice to apologize, uh, she feels ABC executives mishandled this. She followed their playbook. She went on the late show with Stephen Colbert and then apologized again on The View the next day. Uh, you know, what an interesting statement. She followed the playbook. Uh, you know, if you were a member of a certain political persuasion, uh, you get the get-out-of-jail-free card from all of this. Uh, consider the uh, difference between how this was handled and the situation with Gina Carano over at uh, Disney uh, when uh, she was summarily sacked from The Mandalorian for, well... Warning people not to dehumanize their neighbors because it led to other things in history. And also note that her co-star, Pedro Pascal, made the same remarks but towards the other political party. He remains uh, very much hired. Yeah, so, you know, you see this uh, kind of double standard taking place. So uh, Whoopi Goldberg, uh, according to uh, a source close to her, her ego has been hurt. She's telling people she's going to quit The View. Uh, suspension from The View is uh, getting, uh, sus like, suspended from Bravo. The bar is very low. That, that was what the quote was saying. So, you know, the interesting thing about the dust-up with Whoopi Goldberg, a couple things about that. Should Whoopi Goldberg have the right to say even stupid and ill-informed things on television? Absolutely. You know, the right to free speech doesn't mean the right to intelligent speech. It means you have the right 
to free speech. In fact, you know, that's and, the whole point. If we have the opportunity to hear bad opinions, then we also have the opportunity to respond in kind with better ones. And, you know, it seems like the system worked. Uh, the rest of the panelists on The View at that point pushed back on this idea that this was just white on white, so it wasn't about race. Uh, you know, the Nazis definitely saw this about race. And when that was pointed out, she said, no, 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 the Nazis lied about that. Well, not by their lights. They firmly believed that what they were dealing with were subhumans. That's why they could perpetrate the horrors of Auschwitz and Dachau and, and uh, Wittenberg and so on. Uh, if you're not dealing with human beings, then why should you feel guilty about depriving people of human rights? They're not human to start with. And so to say that this was not racial is, you know, non starter beginning. But it also points something out about the redefinition of words and terms. Uh, we hear about critical race theory in our day and age. And critical race theory essentially redefines racism, not as, say, having feelings of hatred or oppression of another people because they come from another background or they look different than you, it defines racism as something that can only be perpetrated by people who are in power on those of another race that are being oppressed. And they also specify white in, in their charter. In, in other words, you can't be a part of one of these designated oppressed groups, hate somebody of a different racial background who's not part of your oppressed group, and be a racist because you're part of the oppressed group. And you don't even have necessarily have to be a race. You so, just qualify as an oppressed group. So, you know, we, we get questions about this and, you know, what is a biblical point of view on all of this? And, you know, I think the biblical point of view in all of this, first of all, I just think it's fascinating that it's all about anti-Semitism. It, it, it's all about, in a sense, papering over the horrors of the Holocaust and saying it wasn't that big of a deal. It was just some white people picking on other white people. It was that big of a deal. Now, I, I, I cannot stress that enough. But when we get involved with this whole concept of racial groups, the division between racial groups, we are saying something that is not biblical at its core. And this is what I mean by that. When the Bible speaks of race, there's a couple of really enlightening passages as far as how God looks at racial issues. One of them is found in the book of Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul, speaking to uh, the, the best and brightest minds from all over the Roman Empire uh, at the Areopagus in Athens, uh, said this about God and his work in this world. Verse 25, nor is God worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries and dwellings. They should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So uh, the Bible's point of view is this. There's one race. It's called the human race. There's one color that we should be concerned about, the color of the one blood that we all share. We are all children, in a sense, of the true and living God, his creation. God is the one who created us. We all go back to Adam and Eve. You know, it's been said, I guess, mathematically, that uh, you meet anyone on planet Earth, you're looking at your sixth cousin because that's the amount of separation there is uh, between us as human beings. The other passage that we need to take to heart as believers in Christ, and I think it's getting lost in a, a lot of the hue, cry, and uproar about critical race theory and, and so on, is in Galatians chapter 3 and uh, verse 26. There we read, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In the book of Colossians, uh, this same point is emphasized in, in a really wonderful way. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11 
uh, the Apostle Paul even goes into more specific detail about this uh, when he said this, uh, but now you yourselves, verse 8, are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither gr Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, who are the Scythians? Well, Scythians were essentially the uncivilized folk of the ancient world. And noting those, likewise with barbarians, those who didn't speak Greek, it was making a class or cultural distinction between groups, just yeah. like with slaves or free, no social distinctions between groups, just like male nor female, no gender distinction between groups in regard to your value before God. Whether you were born from this specific ethnic line, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or not, that's what Gentile means, not, yeah. then you are still valued in the eyes of God. Why? Because you are in Christ Jesus. And I think uh, Ken Ham from Answers in Genesis summarized this well. There are two races, what you're racing towards, away from or towards God. And yeah. that's what matters. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, the, the image of the Scythians to Paul's re uh, readership would have been stunning to them because the Scythians were kind of like the Assyrians. They had a, rela uh, a reputation for uh, being among the, the most brutal and uh, torturous people that you could ever even imagine. Could God love the Scythians? Yeah, he loved the Scythians, just like he loved the Jews and the Greeks and the barbarians and the circumcised and the uncircumcised. You see, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And, you know, again, that has such powerful implications when even a society takes that seriously. I think about the civil rights movement in the 1960s and the progress that was made was based upon an acknowledgement of this truth. You know, as we've mentioned uh, before, uh, one of the greatest speeches I think that has ever been made in uh, American history was Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. In it, he said, I have a dream that one day my children will be not judged on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. Well, that kind of biblical morality uh, overcame incredibly oppressive structures, incredibly entrenched racism. It, it won the heart, mind, and soul uh, of our society. And so uh, incredible progress was able to be made because people realized that race is only skin deep. It's just the amount of melanin that's in your skin or the shape of your eyes or the structure of your face. But the human heart, the human soul, if you will, that God has given to us, is identical there. And so when we see people making distinctions, you know, I think Whoopi Goldberg in a sense was right in that uh, this was man's inhumanity to man being demonstrated during the Holocaust. Likewise, the basic outpouring of her worldview of CRT and saying that these distinctions are either you're, you're not white or you're evil. Yeah, so she got it right, but then she got it wrong uh, in saying that this is just white on white violence if you will it demeans and diminishes the lesson that we should all learn from the holocaust that that kind of awful spiritually based deception and make no doubt about it adolf hitler and his uh, cohorts were knee deep involved in the occult uh, they were committed, uh, some of them, to the worship of Wotan. They Germanic felt, pronunciation of Odin. And they, they felt that, uh, that uh, Christianity was too Jewish. And uh, again, Heinrich Himmler, uh, the architect of the final solution to eliminate the Jews, uh, had a final solution part two, that once the Jews were eliminated, then the Christians would be eliminated, and then true religion the worship of Aryan gods would be uh, restored to the world. And we can document this, but the problem is most people don't care. Yeah. So what you believe about who God is is going to have a huge, huge impact on how you deal with your fellow man. Uh, you know, there are those who say, oh, you know, we shouldn't be colorblind. 
you know, we should uh, acknowledge those distinctions. And, you know, the, the fact of the matter is God did place different nations in different parts of the world so that each of these nations could bring glory to God in different ways, in unique ways, and in special ways. And in a sense, uh, as far as these superficialities are concerned, uh, you know, as the French used to say, viva la difference. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's great that we can have these distinctions. There's nothing wrong with having a sense of identity that's based on some of those distinctions. But when these distinctions end up causing divisions, when it separates you from me and me from you, and, and I feel superior to you because I come from this kind of background, or I think you're inferior because you came from this kind of a background, things we have no control over, we are advocating something, and I'll use the word advisedly, something that's heretical, something that the Bible simply does not teach in direct contradiction to what the Bible teaches. Yeah. So, you know, again, uh, what part of you shall love your neighbor as yourself and who is my neighbor? Remember in the, the parable of the good Samaritan, how Jews were f felt about Samaritans. Yeah, not uh, exactly one in one buddy in arms. They were the descendants of those who had basically compromised on not only a cultural and a religious, but an ethnic level. Notice the sentiment is not biblical, it was theirs. But when they made this observation, when they were taken into captivity by the Assyrians, they got comfortable and intermarried despite Scripture telling them not to do that. Yeah. Their offspring were known as the Samaritans, and when they came back, they had not only adopted this genetic out, uh, poor out demonstration, basically, of their environment, but why... Ezra and Nehemiah distanced themselves from the Samaritans specifically wasn't because of their ethnicity or their heritage, it was because they were also worshiping idols. Right. That they were not going to build the temple of God or the involved with the construction of Jerusalem's rebuilding because they had no heart for the true and living God. They treated him as just one option among many. So if we're going to recognize any difference between people, it's going to be spiritual. If we're going to make differentiation as to how people ought to be treated, we're deceived and deluded, and of course, not disciples of Christ. But if we're also going to be able to navigate this increasingly more difficult minefield that is human language in this day and age, we need to be careful and take the time to say, not only what do I mean, but why do I mean that? And it starts with, of course, truth. If someone denies that basic principle, it was spoken well, well, if you say there is no truth, then don't, isn't that true, or would that be false? It's, it's uh, something that is true by definition, or all of reality falls apart. It's a necessary foundation for facts. In a world that doesn't understand what it's saying, we need to be able to not only speak the truth, but in a way that makes sense. People in echo chambers don't have to be accountable, but I guess sometimes, even in uh, the fulfillment of prophecy, the end times are upon us, even the view can be called out for its nonsense. Yeah. But if we look at our own echo chambers, and we do have them, make sure that they don't sound like that. Yeah, and I think if there's one, if we can sum up uh, where we've been on the broadcast today, Boy, there's one thing. If you want to stay on track as far as your understanding of where we are in relation to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, I think it was our good friend uh, Don Stewart who put it this way. When it comes to God's plan, the right that's really gone wrong and Jesus coming back again, Israel is the hour hand on God's clock, Jerusalem is the minute hand, and the Temple Mount is the second hand. So keep your eyes on Israel. Keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Keep praying uh, for the love of Jesus to reach you. You've been listening to A Reason for Hope. Thank you again for joining us as we continue our journey through God's Word, one question of the heart at a time. Until we meet again, we would love to connect with you. You can text or email your questions to questionsforhope at gmail.com. You can also find out more about our ministry at calvarychristianfellowship.com. And be sure to join us next time on A Reason for Hope. A Reason for Hope is an outreach ministry of Calvary Christian Fellowship in Tucson, Arizona.